I'm excited to introduce you to our next guest, a new book called New Story, New Power, A Woman's Guide to Negotiation has been all the rage and all the conversation among those of us who have been negotiating for ages and said, there's got to be a better way. And what in the world makes it such a difficult thing to do? Beth Fisher Yoshida is with us today. Beth is, and I'll just read you this because I'm never going to remember all her credentials, <laughs> but she is a global expert and educator in inter intercultural negotiation and communication. She's a program director of Columbia University's Master of Science in Negotiation and Conflict Resolution. She is a negotiating consultant for the United Nations, and she's the CEO of Fisher Yoshida International. Beth, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm excited to address this topic specifically around our topic today. Our theme today is all things love in the season of love and the month of February. And in fact, what you have taught me is that successful relationships are simply a series of successful negotiations. <laughs> well, thank you, Lauren, for having me. It's so wonderful to have this kind of a conversation. So yes, and typically in negotiation, when love is involved and strong emotions, we sometimes, and maybe rightly so, put the relationship first beyond what we need. So sometimes we walk away with less than we really wanted as compared to negotiating with somebody who's a stranger who you don't have those same personal ties with. Isn't that the craziest part? The minute there's emotion involved, and I'm literally going through this right now, not not in a an intimate relationship or romantic situation, but with a client who is also a friend. And there, so there's way more emotion involved. And I was asking myself just before I found your book, I was asking myself, why is this so different? Like no man would say that. Why am I saying that? What's intrinsic in my training and my background that makes that so important. So let's talk for a second about women and negotiating in general. Sure, sure. So I think one of the things, and I can't say exactly what's in your background, but in general, we have lots of different messages and stories that we receive over the years. And women are known as caregivers, we're known as the nurturing gender and so on. So we internalize all of those stories that we've heard in our families, in our schools, in the media, and so on, their responsibility is to socialize us, to be good women in the world. And so we bring that with us. So now we're in a situation where women are permitted to show emotions. Men are not permitted to show emotions. It doesn't mean they don't have them. They just don't show them in the same way. I should say women are permitted to show certain emotions like love and hurt and sadness and happiness. Men are allowed to show anger more than women are. Women are not allowed to really show anger because that counters the nurturing, caregiving, kind person. So that's why emotions show up so strongly for us in our negotiations. Because we really are very, for the most part, heart-driven, right? And and I don't, I don't know, I can make certain assumptions as well, right? I raised to be a nice girl, a good girl, you know, to take other people's feelings into consideration. I think, it, and it's not just women, but I do believe that there is um, a different kind of cultural approach to it. And one of the things that really, really shocked me was that in your book, you talk about how most women have never actually negotiated their pay raise, like whatever they're offered, they accept, but they've never actively come back and said, you know what, my I'm valued at this and you're offering me that. So it shows up in so many areas of our lives. And for that reason alone, I really want to encourage our viewers to look for the book, but I don't want to get lost down a different rabbit trail because I really believe that many of us struggle, for instance, around the notion of Valentine's Day and romance and even what to do on the day becomes a negotiation. So let's talk about how negotiations show up in intimate relationships. Sure, sure. So I think one of the things about Valentine's Day is that it's been framed as this is the day of capital T, the day of the year when you really have to be romantic and really have to reinforce your romantic relationship, which puts so much pressure on us to do that. 
So going to the whole idea about relationships in general, I think of negotiation as a relationship building opportunity. So you're in there in a negotiation, building a relationship, which may or may not last. In terms of romantic relationships, of course, you want them to last, but every situation can be a negotiation. And one of the basic principles without getting too technical is that all people have needs that they're trying to satisfy. And so when you think about a romantic relationship, the need to be recognized, the need to belong, the need to have affection, the need to be paid attention to, and all of those things, the need to be heard. So you have to think about not only what your needs are, but also thinking about what the other party's needs are, your romantic other, and then think about how are you going to bring that together so you can be in a situation where both of you feel good about being together, you both feel heard, you both feel acknowledged, which may not show up in the same way. How one party wants to be acknowledged is not necessarily how the other party understands it. And that can also cause some tension in a relationship too. So one of the examples you use in the book, which I love, is a couple where she values more quality time together and he values other things. It's not quite clear what he values, but it's it's not about time because he has so many pulls on his time that he has put value for other things in the middle of the relationship. Quality time is one of my, my top love languages. And so I love spending time even like this with people and having these kinds of conversations. And so I was, as I was reading it, I was thinking in the negotiating process, how do you get people to acknowledge their highest values, their most important values in the relationship? Because a lot of times we just are screaming about what matters to us without really understanding how that lands with our partner. Yeah, so I think that you're never going to be 100% satisfied. I think you need multiple people in your life to be satisfied in different ways. So you have to think about what is the really most critical thing that's important to me about this relationship? And let's say it's 80, 90% of what you want. Is that 80, 90% good enough? Is that 10 or 20% that you're missing too powerful for you that you can't be in that relationship? So in the case of the example in the book, yes, they had you know, different children from different marriages. And so now they're coming together. So they do have a lot of pulls on their time between career and their other families. If you want quality time with somebody, I would ask first, why is that so important to me? So I think we need to understand what that what need that fulfills, because maybe there's another way of getting it satisfied. So maybe quality time could be five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, a week, whatever it is, we have to define that. If it gets to the point, I'm sorry to say, that if you're not getting what you need in the relationship, then you have to re-examine the importance you're placing on that relationship and what else you can do and if that relationship is for you. So it's always a matter of having your own conversation with yourself about what's the most critical and then being in conversation with your partner to see how you're going to come to some agreement or not about what you both need so you both feel good about the relationship. Because at the end of the day, we want to feel good about our relationships. Yeah, more than anything, I think I think we do. And it also is a giant reflection on ourselves. And to your point about Valentine's Day being capital T, um, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's really important to recognize that we have the opportunity to examine our relationships and build them and um you know, make the most of them every day of the year. I know my my father has always said, you know, I don't, I don't, my birthday doesn't matter. The holidays don't, I don't care about the holidays. It's the every day of the year that matters. So your behavior every day of the year will inform me. And, you know, going over the top for a particular day doesn't change the good or the bad you've done the rest of the time. You have all those other days, exactly. exactly. That's your own relationship. Exactly. So I feel like that's a that's kind of a key on any special day. I know a lot of people put emphasis on their birthday and having to celebrate it on the day. Well, what if you did it the following week or the week before because I have to travel on the day? I mean, does is that a deal breaker for the relationship? And uh, there are just different ways to reframe some of these I- things that to your point, a lot of these negotiations fail because of the pressure we put on ourselves rather than the reality of what's in front of us. 
So right. And so, so sometimes people equate, if you pay attention to me on my birthday, because my birthday is important, then that shows you care about me. If you can't be there for me on my birthday, on Valentine's Day, then you don't care. And then I would say, well, okay, why is that so important to me? Like, why do I have that belief? And is it really being fair to the other person? Because maybe there is something that's getting in the way of that person being able to be there. Maybe they have a work commitment that they just can't get out of. It doesn't mean they care about you any less. So you have to really examine, again, going back to the needs, what is so important to me about recognition? How else can I be recognized in a way that I feel good? How else can I be appreciated? And then share that with the other person because why are we playing a guessing game? Your partner should know what it is you need. You were saying about your love language being like quality time. If the partner knows that, that's great. Then you can figure out how to have quality time. But if the other person doesn't know, and then you're constantly missing the mark, then we need to inform better about what we need. Yeah, absolutely. And and what I noticed, because I started thinking as you know, I was reading through your guidance, was the so many new ways that we have to stay in touch, to be in touch, to show we mm-hmm. care. I mean, whether it's the chocolate covered strawberries I send to my clients over the holidays, which are decorated like reindeer. And so they always, get, <laughs> they always get a giant, a giant thank you. And yes, that, that helps people feel cared about um, to just a FaceTime call to check in and get that face to face. Like we've got so many channels that enable us to enhance aspects of our relationships. Right. Are we looking at all of them? And that's part of what I see you guiding people through is that reframe. So walk us through to say, you know, Valentine's Day is creating a riff. And how can we think about it differently? Yeah, so it's an opportunity to think about who I am in this relationship and what I want from the other party, how are we communicating and so on. So I do know somebody, for example, who didn't want to go out for dinner on Valentine's Day because it was very costly because, you know, the restaurants jack up their prices. So he would go out the day before, right? So you could read that different ways. Like you don't care enough about me that you can't even spend the money on a Valentine's Day meal or, well, I appreciate you really wanting to be with me. You're just also being thoughtful about the economy of the situation there. So, you know, again, everything is an opportunity to reflect on yourself. And I think self-awareness is critical and core to everything we do, which you probably saw that message coming loud and clear in the book as well. And so it's a lifelong process. Every time you're in a new situation with a different person, looking at different issues or concerns, you have a chance to reflect on that. So every year, if you know that Valentine's Day is a trigger, it's a super opportunity before you get to that day to sit down and reflect on what's going on here for me. What else am I needing in my life to help me feel more fulfilled? So I don't put all that pressure on myself and my partner for Valentine's Day and communicate. Communication is critical. And in communication, people say we have one mouth and two ears. You really need to spend a lot more time listening. And I say, listen to also what's not being said. Because sometimes you can just read a face and read the behavior and you're saying, okay, he's saying it's okay, but I know something's not okay there. What's going on? So reading those messages, but communicate as much as you can. And I love your point about self-awareness is really the key. Spend the time with yourself first to really understand what your triggers are. I think that's, that's probably the best advice anybody could ever give. Beth Fisher Yoshida, thank you so much for being with us and for sharing. I hope our viewers will run out to find. (laughs) Hope so. (laughs) Well, yeah, I hope so. But it is a new story (laughs) and it does generate new power. So the title is so appropriate. You know, negotiating isn't new. It's been around forever. But our ability to do better once we know better, to quote Maya Angelou, you know, that is our responsibility is to keep growing into being our best selves and especially when we want to show love to those we care about. So it's a good time of year to reflect and remind ourselves. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciated the conversation. Take good care and we'll be right back.